Amen. Well, it's, again, it's such an honor to be with you guys uh, this morning and all week. And um, I'm sad because today we have to fly back to Orlando. But I'm sure we'll be back again soon. So um, we love it here. <clears throat> we love all you guys. And we're just excited about what God's doing in your life and what he's going to do through you. And, um, and so this morning I want to kind of talk about a few things, um, kind of two things that the Lord really put on my heart. Before I get into those, um, I want to make a couple of announcements. Uh, obviously, if you haven't signed up for a newsletter yet, you can do that on the way out. Uh, also, make sure you stop by the product table and buy a shirt or a wristband because um, every shirt we can see, I think it's like 25 people can come to Christ with the proceeds of one t-shirt. So... That's a pretty good investment. And then wristbands um, that say Jesus saves, that we can see about five people come to Christ. Seven people, actually, I have it written down right here. Seven people can come to Christ from the proceeds of one wristband. So make sure you visit that on your way out. And look us up on Facebook, uh, Chris Michelson. You can go to my website as well, chrismichelson.com. And Michelson spelled with two Ks. Uh, looks like Mickelson, M-I-K-K, -K, uh, E-L-S-O-N. So chrismichelson.com or check us out on Facebook. And uh, stay connected with us. Um, if you haven't been here this week, I'm a missionary evangelist. I do gospel crusades around the world. Um, we've been focusing on South Asia right now. And um, we've been in countries near the Middle East preaching the gospel. God is doing incredible things. And uh, next year, I'm believing God that we will see anywhere between 500,000 and a million people come to Christ for the very first time. Come on, will you say amen? So I really would ask you to pray for us. This is a big vision. It's a big dream. It, it's going to take more resources than we've ever had to raise. Um, and, uh, and, it, and it's a faith walk, honestly, because I don't know where the money's going to come from. But I know that if God gives the vision, he provides the resources. Amen? And so I believe it's the Lord's vision and so pray for us. If you want, if you're like, man, my heart is to intercede uh, for people, for ministries, that sort of thing, sign up for our newsletter. We have a box. You can just check the intercessor box on our newsletter. And we only send prayer points, prayer, prayer bullet points for intercessors. We have an intercessor's email list. And we've got people praying and interceding literally all over the world. Um, and, uh, and so if that's your heart, make sure you sign up for that because we go into places where you need prayer, amen? And so um, we would appreciate that very much. Um, but before I get into uh, what the Lord has, I have three things I want to address, two from yesterday. I think yesterday, Dr. Lindsay so graciously pointed out that I said the wrong person. I was talking about uh, one of the apostles who was martyred in Chennai, India, and I was thinking Doubting Thomas, and I said Stephen. So if you're taking notes, just know that Stephen didn't die in Chennai. It was Thomas who, di who died in Chennai. And also when I was talking about um, uh, Jesus saving people, not us. Remember I was talking about that yesterday? How our life is not good enough to, to save anyone. I just want to make that very clear, that you and I cannot save anyone apart from Jesus. Amen? It's only Jesus. He is the Savior. He is the only one who can save because He's the only one who died for our salvation. You can live a very holy life, but your life will never be good enough to lead someone to Jesus apart from the gospel of Jesus. <clears throat> it's only through the gospel. How can they know that he saves unless they hear someone preach the message? Amen? And so, um, so make sure, um, I just wanted to make sure you guys heard that. And this morning, Gabe and I had the opportunity of tag-teaming Nina's class on the kingdom of God. Amen? Wasn't that good? And I was talking this morning, and I felt like this would be really good for everyone here. I was talking this morning about how... A lot of times in our Pentecostal circles, we talk about laying on of hands, and, and, and a lot of times you hear the scripture verse used this way. It's in uh, 1 Timothy 5, where, where uh, Paul is telling Timothy, lay hands on no one suddenly. 
And a lot of Pentecostal circles, they preach that if you lay hands on someone and you're not supposed to, a demon might jump on you and, and take over you. Have, has anyone ever heard that before or is it just me? Okay, no, I've heard, yeah, a lot of you. Listen, that verse is taken completely out of context. It has absolutely nothing to do with demons. It has to do with appointing people into the ministry. Lay hands on them. Don't, don't send them into the ministry in, into a higher level position in ministry suddenly. Like be, have wisdom, use wisdom. Don't, don't make somebody become a pastor if he's not ready to be a pastor, amen? And so that's what that verse has to do with. So um, I wanted to make that clear because I think when we talk about casting out demons and these type of things, there can be a lot of fear, you know, when you're casting out a demon out of somebody or when you see someone manifest demons, like, oh no, I don't wanna, I don't wanna, you know, get demonized. Listen, you're not going to. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in this world. And if the Spirit of God is in you, you have nothing to worry about. Take authority, take a kingdom position, and cast that devil out of them in the name of Jesus Christ. Now, if you're not saved, now that might be a different story. You just need to get saved first, and then you'll cast out devils. Amen? But don't worry. Jesus is in you. Amen? Amen. So those are all extras, okay? That has nothing to do with what I want to teach today. Uh, but this morning, I want to talk to you guys about faith and faithfulness. Faith and faithfulness. You know, it's so important here on this campus to be faithful. And it's important in your Christian life to be faithful to everything that God puts in front of you. I want, I, this was just one topic. I just want to hit it real quick, and then I want to get into a, a, a teaching on faith. But I feel like this is so important for you students as you're here, as you're serving in your student ministry, as you're, as you're serving your pastor at your church. Be faithful to that which you sign up for. If you sign up for the evangelism team and you're not going out on the evangelism outreaches, or if you signed up to do something in your student ministry and you're not fulfilling it, my friend, be faithful with it. Because how is God going to give you more if you're not faithful with the little that you have right now? You know, we have that scripture. I, I love that. It's in, it's in uh, the book of Luke where Jesus has those, the, he gives the parable of the three servants. To one he gives ten, to the other he gives five, and to the last he gives two talents, right? And the first two were faithful, and, and God gave them more. But the last one was unprofitable, an unprofitable servant. He didn't use what was given to him. He didn't use the talent, the money that was given to him. But this can apply to what you have. What has God given you? Are you being faithful with it right now? You know, when I was an evangel uh, on the evangelism team, I remember wanting to preach in churches. And no one was calling me. But I was faithful with what I had. I said, you know what? I don't have people calling me, asking me to come preach at CFNI and at churches and whatnot. But you know what? I have a street corner right down the street where there's all kinds of people waiting for a train that need Jesus. So why don't I just take what I have and be faithful with what I have and go and preach? And then all of a sudden, doors started opening. As I was preaching on the streets and serving my pastor here in town at a small church, he started asking me to come preach for him once in a while. And those doors start to open. So as you're faithful with what you have, God will begin to give you more and more and more. Somebody say amen. amen. We've got to be faithful with what we have. I remember... We, you know, um, as, a, as a brand new Christian, I was um, brand new. I mean, just like not even one years old in Christ. And I'm, and I'm studying the Bible and I'm learning. And, and I had a Jehovah's Witness a boss. And so he and I were always talking about the scripture. And I was just excited about Jesus and wanted him to know Jesus. And so I would come home from work every day after, after work. Um, and I'd grab my Bible and a concordance and my notepad, and I, I'd go up to the coffee shop and, and get a coffee. Well, actually, I didn't have any money at the time, so I would get a Mountain Dew from the vending machine and take it to the coffee shop. That's, that's the poor man's version of going to the coffee shop. 
So I go down to the vending machine in our apartment complex where we were living at the time, and I'd put some money in for a soda, and then I would get my, my Mountain Dew, and I'd take all my books and everything. I'd go down to the coffee, coffee shop and just begin studying the Word, studying the Word. Well, one day, um, I went down to the vending machine. I had all my books and everything in my hands. I put in 50 cents, got a Mountain Dew, and out, out came two Mountain Dews out of the vending machine. I thought, bless God, hallelujah, glory. Two for the price of one. Praise God. And so I grabbed those, and, and I felt like I heard something say, you didn't pay for that second one. And I thought, no, that can't be God. You know, I'm sure that was the devil or pizza that I ate last night or something. And so I'm walking to the car, and I've got all these books in my hands, and I've got these two Mountain Dews, and, and I'm so excited. And then I heard the voice get a little bit louder. You didn't pay for that second one. And by this point, I'm starting to wonder if this is God or not because I'm still kind of like new at, the, at all of this hearing from God stuff. And I, I open the car door in my car, the, 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 the back door, to go put my books in the back seat of the car. And as I was putting the books in the back seat of the car, one of the Mountain Dew cans rolls out, hits the edge, inside edge of my door of my car, and explodes everywhere. And then the voice got real clear. You didn't pay for that second one. And I said, oh, God, I've got to be faithful. I've got to be faithful in the little things. And so I reached into my car. I grabbed 50 cents. I drove up to the office of the complex building that we were in. And I went in and I brought it to the manager. And she looked at me like I was crazy. I was like, listen, I, I didn't pay for it, but I got it on the vending machine. She's like, it doesn't matter. It's only 50 cents. I'm like, no, but you, you got to understand. I just got to pay you for it. You see, you've got to be faithful in a little. If, you're, can, if you can be faithful with 50 cents, God will give you 50 more. And God will begin to give you $50 and 500 because you'll begin to realize, I can trust this person. You've got to be faithful with what you have where you, when you have it. And when you can do that, God will begin to give you more and more and more. And this applies so much to those of you who are sitting in those seats right now. If you can be faithful with your classes, be faithful with your studying, be faithful with your preparation, be faithful at your church. If you tell somebody you're going to sing on their worship team on Sunday morning, and then at, at 9.55 on Sunday morning you wake up and call them and say, hey, bro, I can't make it because you didn't get up in time, why would God then promote you to sing on See if an eyes worship stage or, or some other stage and somewhere else. We've got to be faithful, guys. When God sees that you're faithful with those things, he'll begin to give you more and more and more. Somebody say amen. amen. Okay. So that was faithfulness. We've got to be faithful. You know, when, I, when I'm, you know, with our ministry, it, you make commitments and things get tough. Things get difficult. You know, I'll never forget when we left CFNI and I got a job working as Daniel Kalenda's uh, personal assistant. It got difficult. There were times where, at the beginning, where it, it was overwhelming for me because I was never administrative in my whole life. I had done construction my whole life, and now I got a job as the executive assistant to the president of the largest minist evangelistic ministry in the world. And it got really difficult, and there were times where, at, at the beginning where I wanted to concede to the pressure that was coming around me. But I said, you know what? No, God has provided me with this job. I'm going to go through in Jesus' name. There were times when we started our ministry after, after working for them. We started our ministry. There were times where things got difficult, financial pressures and whatnot. And there were times where it was like we wanted to give up, but we just, we just remembered what God had said. He had called us to do this thing. And if you're faithful in the small things, God will begin to give you more and more and more. You know, our, like I mentioned it a little bit yesterday, but our crusades, when we, when we started doing gospel crusades, they weren't 100,000 people in a meeting. They were... 2,000, 1,000. You know, I, I went to meetings where I, I was told there were going to be 20,000 people there, and I show up on night one, and there's like 800. You know, and, and you can get really 
You can get really mad and you can get really upset, but you just have to say, you know what, Jesus, I'm going to be faithful with the 800 that are right in front of me, and I'm going to preach the gospel like there was 800,000 standing in front of me. And maybe God will open up a door for you to serve some small church while you're here. I preached, at, I served a church, I think there was like 20 people our entire three years that we were here. My wife and I served that church faithfully. And I would go in and prepare and, and preach in that church just as if there was 200 or 2,000 people in that church. When you're faithful with the little things that God gives you, he'll begin to give you more and more and more. Amen? Amen. Turn with me to the book of Matthew chapter 14. <clears throat> Matthew 14. This is one of my favorite stories. Matthew 14, beginning in verse 25. I'm not going to take the time, I don't think, to, to read the whole thing because I want enough time to, to really share what God's put on my heart here. But this is the story of the disciples being out in the water with Jesus. Actually, they were in the boat by themselves. Jesus wasn't even there. And they were crossing the sea, and a storm came into the sea, and they were very afraid of the storm. And as they were being tossed around in the water, they saw what looked like a ghost walking on the water toward them, and it was Jesus, and he said, Do not be afraid. It is I. It's Jesus. And you guys know the story. Peter cries out, and he said, Lord, if it's you, command me to come out to you on the water. And there's a few points here that I think God wanted me to teach on this morning on how to have great faith like Peter. Because I don't know anybody else who's ever walked on water, who had enough faith to walk on water. But Peter that day had enough faith to step out of the boat and put his big size 12 out on the water, and he walked on the water to Jesus. And so I want to encourage you this morning, give you a few points that as you're here at CFNI, and especially when you get out into the ministry, you've got to have great faith if you're going to succeed. There's going to be times where pressures come against you. There's going to be things that, that come against you. And you're going to have to have great faith to overcome in Jesus' name. And so I want to give you just a few, a few things that have really helped me as, uh, as we've been in ministry that have come right out of Matthew chapter number 14. Look with me at verse number 28. Matthew 14, 28. It says, and Peter answered Jesus and said, Lord, if it's you, command me to come out to, to you on the water. Point number one, if you're going to have great faith, you've got to first look to Jesus. Faith starts with Jesus and it ends with Jesus. Peter said, Lord, if that's you, then Command me to come out to you on the water because if it's you, I can do anything. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. If that's you, I know I'll be able to do the miraculous if you allow me to come out to you. Faith starts with Jesus and it ends with Jesus. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence, another word for evidence is conviction or the conviction of things unseen. That word evidence has to do with like conviction in a courtroom. You know, when there's enough evidence that's, that's brought to the judge and the jury, then a conviction can be sentenced. It has to do with, with this, this enough evidence and enough conviction. When you have enough evidence or conviction in a relationship, you can make a big decision. Some of you might be dating people right now. You're in a relationship with somebody, and you just got into the relationship, and you're not sure if this is the one yet. But over time, as you begin to spend more and more time with that person, the evidence and the conviction can begin to grow. 
And pretty soon, before you know it, you, it will be very evident, you'll have enough evidence, and it will be evident to you that this might be the one that I'm supposed to marry or not. And if you want to have great faith, you've got to have great faith in Jesus. And the more time that you spend with Jesus the more it will become evident that he is with you, he'll never leave you, he'll never forsake you, and that you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. you got to spend time with him as you spend time with him. Listen, if you have that relationship with that girl or that boy and you don't spend time together, you're not going to ever know if that's the right one or not. It takes time being with somebody and spending time with somebody. If you want great faith, you've got to spend time with Jesus. Get alone with him. Hebrews 12, 2 says, looking unto Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. You see, when you look upon Jesus and you spend time with him, and you're now I'm not talking about at 8 o'clock in the IB. I mean, that, you can have great encounters with God here, but it has to go deeper than that. Because when 8 o'clock in the IB ends and you're out there in the real world, if you don't have a relationship with Him on your own, by yourself every day, your faith will struggle. I've seen so many people, great, anointed young people who went to this school, who sat with me, who I thought, man, they're going to have the biggest ministries in the world who aren't even serving God and who are on drugs right now. Because I, and I don't know why, but I know that this is one of the main things. If you'll spend time with Jesus every day, he'll convict you of things that you shouldn't do. He'll correct you. He'll lovingly push you forward and help you to live this life out and fulfill the call of God that's on your life. you got to spend time with him. Amen? Peter, in the midst of this storm, knew that if he called to Jesus, Jesus could do anything in the midst of that storm. So Peter calls to Jesus, and Jesus says, yeah, come on, Peter. Come on, Pete. Come out to me on the water. And Peter stepped out onto the water. Look with me here at verse number 29. So Jesus said to Peter, one word, come. And when Peter had come out of the boat, he began to walk on the water to Jesus. Jesus said one word, come. My friends, if we're going to have great faith that's going to take us around the world preaching the gospel, that's going to see our world turned upside down. you got to get this point. Faith is not based on our feelings or our experiences. It is based on the Word of God. Faith is not based on your experience or your feelings. It's based solely on the Word. If our faith is based on our feelings, then as soon as you don't feel good, pretty soon you'll lose your faith. If your faith is only based on your feelings, you come in here and you'll have goosebumps and you'll be like, I believe, I believe, I believe. But then as soon as the devil comes against you, as soon as some obstacle comes your way, you'll crash and not have faith because your faith was based on emotions and feelings and not the word of God. You see, Peter here, he looked at Jesus and he said, Jesus, if you call to me, I can can come out under that water. And Jesus said one word. He said, come. And Peter said, come. I can walk on that word. I can walk on the the word of God. Peter took his big size 12 and he stepped out of the boat and he put his foot down on the water. Now I know the text says right there that Peter walked on the water, but you know what? I don't think Peter was just walking on the water. Because Peter was a fisherman. He knew it's impossible for a human being to walk on water. But if we can hear the voice and the word of God, the word of Jesus say come, that's enough for me to walk on. So as Peter heard that word come, he said, I can stand on that word come, 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 come. And he walked on the word of Jesus. 
My friends, you can walk on the word. You can stand on the word of God. The word of God will help you to be able to do the miraculous. Peter walked on the word. The Romans 10, 17 says that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. As you hear the word and as you believe the word, faith can arise and you can do the miraculous in Jesus' name. Matthew 24, 25 says that heaven and earth will pass away. Jesus says, but my words will never pass away. Matthew 7, 24 says that Jesus closed his sermon on the mount with the story about a foolish man who built his house on the sand. He built his house on the sand, and when the storm came, it sank. It it was completely destroyed. But another man built his house on the rock. Jesus is the rock. He is the Word, John 1, 1. He is the Word of God that became flesh and dwelt among us. When you build your foundation on the Word of God, it will stand forever. You've got to stand on the Word. You see, when I, was, when I first went to Pakistan, my first trip to Pakistan a couple years ago, amen, I was, I, I'll just be honest with you, I was scared. Because I was going into a country where you could be killed for preaching the gospel. And I'll, I'll never forget, I, I got there, I knew God had, had spoken to me and said to go. That's point number one. You better have a word from God that you can actually stand on, okay? Don't just go because you feel like it's a good idea. Your feelings will, will crash, but the word of God will stand. God spoke to me and said to go. So I went on this scouting trip. I, I wasn't even doing a, my own crusade. I was just there. I was visiting a friend of mine who was doing a gospel crusade there. I was going to kind of scout things out and learn and, and see about doing one there in the future. And so I'm there with him, and I'm, I'm ministering in the pastor's conferences. We ministered to like over 1,000 pastors in a couple of days. And, uh, and, and, and the night came where we went to the gospel campaign. And, and we got to this gospel campaign, and here's, here's a crowd of thousands of people st- standing there. And, and where we drove up to the, the campaign, we got out of the vehicle, and the only way to get from our vehicle to the stage was to walk through a big aisle down the center of this crowd. And so we're walking down this aisle, and everyone's dancing and clapping and worshiping, and they're, they're cheering for us as we're walking. And, and, and I'm looking around at our security team. Because when you go into Pakistan, you better have some good security too, amen? And so we had this security team that had been hired. But there, how many of you know there's no Christian security companies in Pakistan? Christianity was, at this point was not even 1% Christianity. Now I think it's just over 2%. But, so, so a, a, a local security company had been hired who were not Christians. And there, there are security guards. And it's always in the back of my mind, like, hey, I, if I don't say something right, or if I say the wrong thing, one of these security guards who's carrying a gun might be the first one to take me out. And so we're walking down this aisle, and everyone's cheering, and, and we're walking up to a building where the stage was up against a building, and on top of a building, there's a man standing there in, in, in a local outfit, traditional outfit, with a turban on his head, and he's dancing, and he's holding up his gun in the air, dancing, and I'm walking right toward him. And my heart began to sink into my stomach, and I thought, oh God, this might be the end. This might be how I go down. And I look over at my buddy, and, and, and I was like, hey, bro. And he looks at me, he's like, bro, it's getting real right now. And I said, yeah, it is. He's like, this might be how we go down. And I said, yeah, this might be how we go down. Like, this might be our story. And fear began to grip my heart. This, this intense fear gripped my heart. And those thoughts of this might be how we go down began to ring inside my mind. And then all of a sudden, I began to Remember what the Word says. And I began to remember Bible verses like, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. And I remember what the Bible says, that I shall not live, that I shall live and not die and declare the works of the Lord. 
I remember how the word says that I am more than a conqueror through him who loves me. That, I, that, that the Lord is my helper and I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? I began to remember Psalm chapter 91. And how Psalm 91, this is what I do when I read Psalm 91. I put myself into the scripture. And I read it as if it was being read about me. And I say, I will dwell in the secret place of the Most High. And I, will, and I shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I began to remember these scriptures in Psalm 91. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. He is my God in Him I will trust. Surely He will deliver me from the snare of the fowler and from perilous pestilence. He shall cover me with His feathers and under His wings I will take refuge. His truth shall be my shield and my buckler. I will not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, nor of pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at my side and ten thousand at my right hand, but it shall not come near me. I began to remember the word. When you put yourself on the solid foundation of the Word of God, all of a sudden fear begins to leave and faith begins to arise. Amen? You've got to stand on the Word. When I did that, immediately the fear left me. I began quoting those scriptures. I'm like, you know what? Jesus has not called me here to just die. He's called me here to live. He's called me here for a purpose. And that purpose is to see this nation shaken with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. But you've got to stand on the word. If you don't stand on the word, that, that fear will overtake you and you'll begin to sink and you'll begin to crumble. We see here in verses 31 and 30, uh, 30 and 31 that Peter got his eyes off of Jesus. And it says that he began to look at the waves that were coming around him. And when he got his eyes off of Jesus, the word of God, Jesus, the incarnate word of God, he began to sink. You see, my friends, fear and, and your circumstances, if you don't keep your eyes on Jesus, and if you don't stand on the word, you'll always begin to sink. But my friends, faith in Jesus, faith in the word of God will cause you to stand. It will cause you to do great and mighty things in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Last thing I want to talk about this morning. If we're going to have great faith, we need to realize that faith is spelled T-R-U-S-T. -S trust. Faith is spelled T-R-U-S-T, -S trust. Proverbs says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your path. Another way to spell trust is R-I-S, or to spell faith is R-I-S-K, risk. You see, great faith will always cause you to take great risks when you trust Jesus, when you trust what Jesus has told you. We don't take risks just for risk's sake and hope that God said that God will bless what we do. But when you believe God's word, and you, you, it will usually cause you to step out and take a great risk and a great level of trust in Jesus. I remember when we, we launched our ministry, um, we had nothing. On March 1st, 2015, my wife and I left a very, I left a very good paying job. I was organizing USA Crusades for Reinhard Bonnke's Gospel Crusades here in the USA. As I had a very high level position, but God spoke to us and he said, it's time to launch out. I got three prophetic words in two days from three people I didn't know and all three of them said it's time to launch out. And so I talked to Daniel and Reinhardt, and, and it was something that was very difficult for me to do because I loved working for them. They're great mentors of mine in the faith. But when God speaks, you've got to obey, amen? And so God said, it's time to go. It's time to launch out. And so we didn't have any partners. We didn't have any financial income. But on March 1st, 2015, 
my wife and I were on our own. We had started our own nonprofit, and we just said, okay, Jesus, if you've called us, if you said go, then you'll provide a way. And by faith, I put, uh, I had called up a crusade director in India, and we had organized, we had planned our first crusade, which would happen only two months later. And I needed to raise $15,000 in two months for that crusade, and somehow I needed to raise money to pay rent in our apartment and put food on the table and put gas in the car and et cetera. And I had nothing. I had no partners. And I just began to trust God. I said, God, if you've called me, you're going to make a way where there seems to be no way. And I began to remember what Reinhard Bonnke encouraged us He gave us this word right before we left. He said, and he used to say it all the time. He used to say, I don't plan with what's in my pocket. I plan with what's in God's pocket. Amen? And so by faith, I said, you know what? I don't know if I've got enough faith to believe for a million-dollar crusade, but I've got enough faith to believe for 15 grand in two months. And all of a sudden, we began to send out newsletters. Now, now here's the other thing, friends. If you're just going to sit on your sofa and believe God's going to just start sending checks in the mail, you, you better get another idea, okay? Because it's not just going to come in. God doesn't bless you to just sit on your sofa. He blesses those who go with the gospel. He blesses those who are willing to work and put in labor. And so my wife and I began to send out newsletters and emails, and we designed a website, and we put everything together that we knew that we could do. And at the end of the day, we just said, oh, Jesus, you got to help us. you just got to make a way where there seems to be no way. And all of a sudden, checks started coming in the mail, and, and checks started coming in online, and, and somehow, some way, it was just miraculous. Every step of the way... God started to provide. And you know, two and a half years later, right now, not once have we ever missed payroll. Not once have we ever missed a crusade because we didn't have finances. God has come through every single time in Jesus' name. Amen. I never forget one crusade um, about a year and a half ago. We were 20... We were $12,000 short. And uh, we still needed tw- this $12,000 for this crusade. I woke up one morning needing twelve grand, and I was getting on the plane to go to that country to do the crusade that afternoon. And I got up and I got into my prayer closet like I always do. I just get before Jesus for at least one or two hours every day. Not to prepare, to prepare for sermons, but to just be with him. And I got in and I just began to pray and just spend time with him and worship. And, and I just, during that prayer thing, I just gave my, that burden to God. I just said, oh God, I need $12,000 today and I don't know where it's going to come from. But I said, I trust you. I trust you. See, that's where faith comes. It trusts Jesus. It trusts the word that he's given you. And so I just said, God, I trust you. I don't know where it's going to come from. I don't know how we're going to do this, but I trust you're going to provide a miracle. I had called everyone I knew to call. I had emailed everyone I knew to email, and I was still short. About six months prior to that, I had called a guy who, uh, who I, I thought could probably write a check for $12,000, but I wasn't sure. I'd only talked to him one time before that. And I had tried calling him six months prior to sit down and have coffee with him. And I hadn't heard back in six months. I got out of my prayer closet a couple hours later. I decided I was going to go out to the garage to get a little workout on before getting on the airplane. And my phone rings and it's this guy that I called six months prior. And I said, he, he, he answers, he goes, hey, would you like to go out and have coffee this week? I said, well, I would love to, but I'm actually getting on a plane this afternoon to go to this country to do a gospel crusade. He said, oh, wow, praise God. I said, listen, we're still $12,000 short. I don't know if there's any way you could even help with that. I didn't know if he could or not. He said, oh, yeah, no problem. I'll send a check right now. Come on. Thank you, Jesus. God has provided. See, when God gives you a vision, when it's a God vision, not a man vision, not a, not a oh, I think this is going to be a great idea for me and, and I'm going to be able to put pictures on Facebook and show the world how, how wonderful I am. 
But when it's a God vision, when God gives you something and he speaks to you, he will begin to provide your needs as you step out. But you better know that it's Jesus. And, you've, and, and, and when you do, follow him with relentlessness and trust him and God will provide every need in Jesus' name. Amen? Come on, this is good. Jesus is good. Amen? He'll provide for you guys. Now listen, I didn't graduate CFNI and go straight into doing gospel crusades. Sometimes there's those seasons where you've got to trust the word of God even when it doesn't seem like it's going to happen. I left here and, and yeah, I got a great job working with Daniel Kalenda and Reinhard Bonnke and I was learning a lot. But there were times during that season where I was so overwhelmed with work and, and with all of these things that that, that vision, you, you start to wonder, am I ever going to do gospel crusades of my own? Am I ever going to fulfill what God spoke to me when I was at CFNI, when I got anointed as an evangelist in that prayer meeting? Is that ever going to happen? But my friends, you've got to just continue to believe and pray and say, one day God's going to show me. One day God's going to speak to me. And everything is going to come to pass in Jesus' name. And sometimes that vision takes years to come to pass. But don't be afraid to serve and to be obedient right where you are and continue to pray and believe. And one day, my friends, God's going to open that door up for you. After three and a half years, that doesn't sound like a long time, but it's a long time when you're in it. But after three and a half years of serving them, God spoke. I had th those three prophetic words, and I just knew. It was, it was hard. It was hard because you're like battling this thing. It's like, man, I'm, I'm going to step out into the complete unknown with no partners, no finances. How are we going to do this? But I, I just couldn't get away from those three prophetic words. And then I shared them with my wife, and she's like, well, I actually had a dream a, a few nights ago. I, I was waiting for you to hear from God for yourself, but God showed me a few nights ago that we were supposed to launch out. And so then more confirmation comes. And we just knew that we knew that we knew. So my friends, as you go out, God was, he's going to show you guys what to do. He's going to give you faith, radical, crazy faith in Jesus. And radical, crazy faith in Jesus equals radical, crazy miracles for Jesus. Amen? Why don't you stand to your feet? We've still got a few more minutes, so if you don't have to leave, don't leave quite yet. But I want to pray for you guys. I believe God is going to send people from this place. If the worship team could come back, that would be great. But I believe Jesus is going to do radical, crazy things in your life, in your ministry. And, and I would just love to pray for you. If you want to have just an increase of, of boldness and faith, and you want God to move in your life, and, and I believe and believe maybe God will speak to you this morning and, and drop vision and destiny into your heart this morning. Uh, I want to pray for you. So if you need prayer, you want greater faith, or you want to move in greater miracles or, 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 or destiny or whatever it is, I want to just call you to come up right now in Jesus' name. That's you. Come to the front. I'd love to pray for you guys. Do we have a worship team? Or just somebody to play keys? That'd be great. Hallelujah. Come on. Come on. Are you guys excited? There's destiny here. There is nations here that I believe will be shaken because of your obedience to Jesus. You got to just keep, stay obedient. Keep following him.